This is the Augusteum. It is named after Duke August, the guy who's on our building. He's the Duke who finally um, eliminates crypto-Calvinism, at least for the end of his reign. This building is built as an addition to the university in front of Luther's house. Luther's house, we'll walk through here and we'll see the monastery. Luther first came there in 1508. He stayed for about a year. I think there are indications that he did not have enough money to continue. He went back, ends up taking his trip to Rome in 1510-11, I believe. Then he comes back here around 1511 and begins to lecture. Uh, when he got married to Katie, Frederick gave him the house and he owned the property in front all the way to the street. Over time, he purchased the property to the right and to the left. Just in front of the house when he first came, there was a dilapidated wood church. That's where he first started to preach. Uh, probably it, around 12, 13, 14, something like that. And he gets noticed. And they notice he's really a great preacher. And then he ends up getting picked up as preacher for the town church. Luther joined this Orden um, in Erfurt and father in his Orden was Johann von, von Staupitz. He took a good pastoral care on Luther and gave him in Erfurt some advisement, spiritual advisement and lead him uh, and show him the way directly to Jesus Christ according the Augustinian tradition and Luther read St. Augustine um, and he knew him by heart and after coming to Wittenberg he lived here in the monasterium and um, finally uh, after the Reformation comes up uh, he lived mainly alone in this house and he slept on a sack on, on the earth and was very poor and he wear his old black and white ministerial clothes and um, so uh, Katie uh, when he married in, in 1525 um, he need to to bring him back to life and to to give him the right food and watching that he wash himself every day and so he comes to a better life <laughs> that is meaningful until today uh, we as pastors are nothing without our wives mainly <laughs> spoken this house looks a lot like it did at, at luther's time this tower was actually built uh, probably I think in 1570 or so, so it's not, it's not Luther's era. It was actually built by the same person who built our school. Luther had a, a continuing um, dispute with a guy named von Metsch, I believe, and he was uh, somehow in charge of maintaining the wall around the city. And you notice the, the wall came right behind Luther's house here, and if you see the elevated ground to the end of the town, that was sort of the elevated rampart, although it's, it's moved over the centuries. and. Uh, this match, apparently, it, it's been difficult for scholars over the years to figure out where, what Luther was talking about when he talked about the little room from which he stormed the papacy. Well, I think Brecht says it was this little tower that was off the back the southwest side of this building. And when you go into the museum, you'll find in that side, second floor maybe, there's a doorway which is bricked up. You can't go anywhere. Well, uh, Brecht says that this Metsch, in repairing the wall, knocked down Luther's little room where he had had his Reformation discovery. This door here is called the Katy door. I think it, it was as given to Luther as a gift by Katie in 1535.
Luther had, I think, six children. Yes. Two of them died in, uh, as, as children. There's one account where I think his daughter is dying at, at 12 or 14, and Luther is saying, now you, you know that uh, it will be wonderful for you to go to heaven and be with Christ. We would love to have you stay with us. She said, I know it will be wonderful. Martin's at the, the side of his daughter, and Katie's further down the bed, weeping, sobbing, because she cannot, she cannot bear to uh, get any closer because of the situation. This is the place where they would meet to translate the Bible. His best friends would come here. It's a room that is pretty much stuck as it was from about 1600. So it's probably the original wallpaper, probably the stove, uh, the shelves. You just really got to go in there and have a good look. Uh, this is a place where a lot of the table talk occurs. All these volumes with table talks uh, was written and took by the minutes here in the, this place. I can imagine that uh, Katie was uh, mainly a businesswoman. She owned uh, at least uh, two big farms out of Wittenberg, and that was necessary to, to earn the life of the students here inside. A lot of students live here inside, and you can imagine that was a student's hostel. And uh, Luther invited a lot of people without asking his wife, so Katie was very, very busy. In 1527, with the plague, it's at that time that Luther writes his document on whether one is free to flee the plague or not. He, of course, stays behind. This building is basically transferred into a hospital, 1527, and he's got friends. Georg Rehr, who's a deacon, lives down at the other end of town. His wife comes to stay. They're ill. His wife passes away. They lose a child. Uh, I think Bugenhagen may have lost a child, came to stay here during the plague. So it was a uh, a source, there were a lot of difficult things that happened here. This is a depiction of the church, and uh, that is the earliest depiction of the church after the Small Cold War. The church had long, skinny spires, and because of the war, they knocked those spires off so they would have a flat service to place the cannon. And it wasn't until 54 or so, seven years after the war, that they built the style of uh, the building up there. Some dates on the building. It's kind of a strange looking building. This is backwards, but this rear part was the original church, be sometime before 1300. On the other side, there's a uh, an addition that occurred in the 70s, the Ordinationsstube. All ordinations beginning 1535 when the Lutherans started to ordain, for 150 years, all ordinations occurred here. Martin Kamnitz, for instance, was ordained here. So they added onto the other side. But then the, the main nave, 1412, built 1412 to 1439. For some reason, the towers are 1361. I don't know if that was a long-term plan or what, what was going on, who knows. And then as we said before, the stubby uh, church towers tops are from 1556. So it's an interesting conglomeration. Shall we go inside? left-hand side, the congregation, right, the preacher, and in the mid, Jesus Christ. That is all what you can say about preaching. And over that, in the mid, the, the biggest picture, Lord's Supper, uh, you can see Luther, he's receiving the uh, child, uh, the friends of Luther, also Cranach, is uh, on this picture. 
and that shows the Lord's Supper is in the midst of our Lutheran confession and Lutheran faith. Right inside you can see Johann Bugenhagen. We had seen his pastoral personage right over here. And uh, Johann Bugenhagen um, is a stay for confession and absolution here. And on the left hand side, uh, Melanchthon is baptizing a little child in a huge baptismal font. This font up here is the font uh, created by one Fischer famous artist of the period, and it's from 1465. So Luther's children were baptized in that very font, so far as they were baptized in the church, I think they were. So that font has baptized a lot of very significant and great people. Look at these verses. So we maintain that a man is justified without the works of the law alone through faith, Romans 3, 28. Then you've got the famous verse in the back here, just in front of the organ, of course, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing you, etc., with psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, etc., which you might expect. This is a precious thing uh, to thank the Lord and sing praises to his name, you daughter of the morning. And by the way, they've just, after the renovation, they put the portraits of former superintendents and very significant personages. Uh, the one I recognize is Quenstedt right there to on the right, Andrew Andreas Quenstedt, the bookkeeper of orthodoxy. It was very common for, for Cronach to put an eschatological depiction on the obverse, reverse sides of his altarpieces. Here you have the damned below, and obviously the victory over death is here. But this is quite interesting because you notice all this, the graffiti. It became common, I believe particularly for theological students, when they flunked out of school, they would come and scratch their name in here as one of the damned. And there happens to be one right there, Johann Luther. So when Luther's son flunks out of the theology school, he came and scribbled his name in the back as one of the damned. These are uh, confessional booths. So when your people say that this is a strange, odd custom that has no place in Lutheranism, well, it was a practice that was retained intensely right through the 17th century till the period of pietism, really. And I believe that these are various uh, epitaphs to significant personages by Cronach. This is their Weinberg das Herrn, the vineyard of the Lord. It depicts, and I have a key to the theologian it depicts, but it, it depicts, you see the papal workers of the vineyard on the left, they're throwing stones in the well, they're tearing things up, they're all dressed in papal and Roman garb. This is an epitaph to our hero, uh, Eber, who's a bit of a Melanchthon, Melanchthonian, but he's the guy who was superintendent when our school was built, so he's got his name on the front. You've got the papal crowd over here. They're digging things up, tearing down, hacking away. And then you've got Luther in the middle here, raking, taking care. You've got wa people watering. There's Philip at the well, you see him? And uh, there's a whole list of these various theologians right here. So we're gonna find them. So we got Luther right here, right. Number two, we got Melanchthon, we know that one. Number three, who's the guy on the other side of the well? Johann Forster, dies in 1515 
Engelstadt. Then there's number four. That looks like Jonas, I think, in that coat right there. Let's see if let's see who that is. That's Bugenhagen, as I said. <laughs> That's Bugenhagen. He has white hair by the time he dies. Then number five, just to the left and up of him, Georg May uh, Mayor, George Major, of the famous Majoristic Controversy. Number six, looks like he's got the, yes, he's got the grapes on his back. That's Paul Krell from Eisleben. Kasper Krusiger in front of him, who's, uh, let's see, number seven. Crucifer to the right of him. He's one of the translators of the Bible Project. Number eight, to the right of Krusiger is number eight is Justice Jonas, Luther's buddy. What is most interesting for me is guess who this guy is with the beard over all in the beard over here, clear over in the right of the vineyard. Any guesses? Matthias Flatus Illyricus. And I think, it, isn't it interesting that Cronach should plant him in the, in Wittenberg, he puts Flatius, who's the great opponent of Melanchthon, the opponent of Wittenberg theology. Isn't that fascinating? 